Chapter 26. Our footpath finally came to an end on a winding paved road just wide enough for a single car. The road was sunk deep down with high banks on either side and the hedges on the top of the banks. So it was like standing in a 10-foot trench with a low gray lid, which was the sky. Birds were zooming in and out of the hedges, singing and squawking, and probably wondering what we were doing here since the wild world had been mostly theirs for months now. Neither of us liked being on the road at all exposed, so anyone could drive up behind us any time, because there was no place to hide without scrambling up a 10-foot slope. But along with being nervous, there was a secret feeling of exhilaration to think we might almost be somewhere. From the map, it looked like we were less than a mile from Kingley, but unless we found a nice policeman or friendly milkmaid to give us directions to Gateshead Farm, we didn't have a clue what road it was on or where we would find it. We walked about a quarter of a mile past a handful of empty boarded-up houses and came to a signpost that pointed toward King Lane Hopton and Uswithle. So we kept walking, hoping the, for the best. What, when what you do know, when what do you know, the next turn had a faded wooden sign on it saying it was called Gateshead Lane, and by now Piper and I were almost running. Neither of us wanted to speculate about what we'd find when we got to the farm, but no matter how I tried to calm down, I couldn't stop the hope and excitement in my chest, making my heart crash against my ribs, and Piper seemed unnaturally flushed. About half a mile, we thought maybe it wasn't the right road after all, but we kept going because there was nothing else to do. And finally, there was a sign and a gate and a couple of farm machines like threshers marooned in mid-thresh, and the nervous, excited feeling began shifting into something anxious and dark, as we walked through the gate, because I did not know for one second, because I did not for one second like the atmosphere of the place. You couldn't really see the farm from the road, but we saw a lot of birds flying around to the left. So we walked forward carefully and finally came around a bend and saw the main barn and still no signs of life. And now all I wanted to do was run away as fast as I could, because you didn't need to be a child genius to get the feeling that all those birds were circling around for a reason. I'd been imagining what we'd do if the farm had been taken over by the enemy and Isaac and Edmund and everyone had taken was taken prisoner. But I had to pretend they were still alive because there's no way any person with an ounce of sanity is going to walk on starvation rations for almost a week believing in the possibility of bad news. You don't always get a chance to choose the kind of news you get. Put yourselves in our shoes for a minute, walking into this deserted place like a glowing, glowering gray September day when it should be filled with animals and people and life. But what you find is nothing, no sign of people, just the eeriest lack of noise possible and nothing moving except the big black birds in the air and legions of crows standing absolutely still watching you. Then we see the foxes. My first thought was that they were beautiful, sleek and well-fed and vivid orangey red with sharp little intelligent faces and it didn't occur to me till second thought to wonder why there were so many of them and why they didn't run away. Well, why would they? It was a paradise. Dead things everywhere, and when the stink hit you, it was like nothing you ever smelled before. And when you hear people say that something smells like death, trust them, because that's the only way to describe what it smells like. Putrid and rotting, and so foul, your stomach tries to vault through your throat, and if your brain has any sense, it wants to jump out of your skull and run away as fast as possible, with or without the rest of you, so it doesn't ever have to find out what's making that smell. Having come this far, I didn't know how not to keep going. My legs kept walking forward, and when I got a little closer, I could see that some of the bodies were human, and then a kind of coldness came over me, and no matter what I discovered, I wasn't going to scream or cry or anything. I was ice. The birds were pecking at a dead face in front of me, tugging at the skin, using their beaks to pull jagged purple strips of flesh free from the bone, and they flew up into the air for a few seconds when I waved my arm so I could see what was left of it, and by that time, I knew from the size of the body and the clothes that it couldn't be Edmund. And if it couldn't be Edmund, it couldn't be Isaac. And it wasn't Osbert either. There were more bodies. Seventeen in all that I could see. And only one I thought I recognized. I was pretty sure it was Dr. Jameson. And the shock of seeing someone dead that I knew set off a new attack of panic. My legs started to shake against each other so hard that I had to squat down in the dirt to keep from falling over. One by one. One by one, I approached the body as nice and methodical, saw how dead each one was, and somehow... And same time, how young. And one by one, each turned out not to be the person I most feared it would be. They were all over the farmyard and all looked like they'd been running away or crouching down, trying to hide or protect someone else. And when they still had faces, you could see the looks of fear and dread, at least in the shape of the mouth, because their eyes and lips were the first things to go. 
I started out trying to scare the foxes away from the bodies, and I ran at them crazy with rage, but they barely seemed to notice me unless I actually kicked them, and then they retreated a few steps, still holding on to whatever body part they were biting, and looking at me dispassionately, and I'm sure they could tell I was afraid. Altogether, I found nine men, three women, and five children. One of the children was a girl, younger than Albie, still with her mother's arms around her. The woman looked young, but like all the women, were full, was fully dressed in dirty, bloodstained clothes so that whatever funny business you'd expect in a war hadn't happened here, other than murder and cold blood. As for how long they di- ago they died, I couldn't tell. Long enough, I guess, for the insides to start rotting and the crows and foxes to call their friends and family around for a party. Beyond in the covered paddocks were the animals, mostly cows and half-grown calves, nearly a hundred of them, crammed together with no food, mostly dead, but a few still standing and some lying down making a harsh moaning kind of noise when they breathed. When I took a few steps closer, clouds of birds launched themselves a few feet into the air and then settled right back down again and went back to pecking and fighting over the best parts. And now that I was a little closer, I could see the rats crawling out from inside the dead animals and foxes tugging at stinking intestines exposed through holes torn in the flesh. And a feeling came over me that I didn't get, that if I didn't get as far away from there soon, as possible i was going to start screaming and never stop i started to run and heard myself panting with panic and i looked around for piper who was nowhere to be seen and i yelled piper 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 barely drawing breath or giving her time to answer and there was no sign of her anywhere and the hysteria rose like the sea until i was drowning in it and i ran into the only place left which was the barn and there she was just kneeling there tears streaming silently down her face with her arms around an animal and it wasn't until i heard a fur- faint ding when it moved that i realized who it was, only I never would have recognized him because he was covered in shit and as thin as the thinnest thing that could still be alive, and I guess he'd been left in there with no food for much too long, and his eyes were dull, but he recognized Piper and me, and dinged his bell and rubbed his baby horns against Piper as best he could, given that he was mostly dead. Ding. He was too weak to stand up and too sick to care about the water Piper brought him. So I covered him with a grain sack and shot him in the head. Then I took Piper back home. We didn't even bother camping, but just walked along the road as fast as we could with the strength we had left, scrambling into the bushes whenever trucks went by and staying there until it was safe. It was never really safe. There were men with torches and we heard them shouting and the trucks were passing pretty often and under different circumstances, we might've felt scared. We made slow progress. We didn't speak, but I held Piper's hand and told her over and over that I loved her. Through the blood beating in my veins and running down through my hand and into my fingers. Her hand started out limp and cold like a dead thing, but I willed it back to life until after hours of walking, the fingers started to grip mine, a little at first and then harder, and eventually I knew for sure it was alive. At sunset, the sky cleared and turned orange and gray and pink, and the temperature started to drop. But to compensate, there was a bright moon, so we wrapped ourselves in our blankets and kept walking. Following the map with what And what with all the stopping to hide and occasionally to rest, it was nearly morning, but still dark when we came through the deserted village, past the pub and the village shop, and started up the familiar long hill to the house. I expected the landscape to be barren and dead, but it wasn't. The hedgerows sagged under the weight of life. Berries and flowers and birds' nests. The optimism of it should have cheered me up a little, but it didn't. It was like seeing a vision of some past life, a life so recent and so distant that I could remember the exhilaration without being able to remember what it felt like. In my new incarnation, I expected nothing, good or bad. The house looked deserted, dark and silent, and even the honey-colored stone had the feeling of something abandoned. The old jeep was parked off to the side where we left it when the gas gave out. There were no signs of life, no signs of death either. I wish I could say my heart soared at the sight of it, but it didn't. What heart I had left no longer felt like flesh and blood, lead maybe, or stone. I told Piper to stay outside and she sank down with her head cradled in her arms while I crept in and looked around. But I didn't have the energy or the courage for a room-by-room search. So I went straight to the pantry and in the back of the low cupboard found a can of tomatoes and one of chickpeas and one of soup and a glass jar labeled chutney that looked like it'd be the last thing you'd find in the pantry when everyone was starving to death in a war, but at least it was food. I smashed a hole in the top of the can of tomatoes and gave it to Piper, who sucked out the juice and gave it back to me to finish. Then, as the sun started to come up, we made our way slowly, wounded and exhausted, into the lamb barn. There must have been thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of places in England that hadn't been touched by war, 
The bottoms of lakes, the tops of trees, the far corners of forgotten meadows, little remote corners where no one ever went in peacetime because the place wasn't important enough or on the way to anything else where no one could be bothered to ruin it. The lambing barn was one of them. Although it was nearly October, there were still enough leaves on the trees to hide it completely from the path, and the blood froze in my veins until we pushed through the overgrown path and saw that it was still there. It was still there, despite all the death and disease and misery and sadness and loss everywhere else. Inside it looked mercifully untouched. No one had been there since the night a thousand years ago when we all slept together happy. The good news was that we'd been too lazy at the time to lug everything back to the house, so there were blankets still laid out on the hay, and even a few clothes the boys had left behind, t-shirts and spare jeans and socks, worn back in a universe where you wore things once and then put different things on. Exhausted as I was, I said to Piper I had to make sure there was nothing left of the smell of yesterday anywhere on my skin. So in the pale weak sun of early morning, I rubbed myself all over with freezing water from the metal trough and put on a pair of Edmunds jeans and a t-shirt. And though there was nothing left in the smell of him on, on them, Nothing left of the smell of him on them. I felt better wearing his clothes. I couldn't face the filthy sweater I'd been wearing every day to keep warm. And although the new clothes were a little musty, when I crawled in between the wool blankets and put my head down next to Piper's, I felt almost clean and safe and best of all home. That night, I slept the dream deep, dreamless sleep of the dead. Chapter 27 We could have moved back to the big house, but we didn't. Maybe it was too close to the road, or maybe we turned a little wild and couldn't live in a normal house anymore. Whatever it was, we stayed up in the barn doing nothing but sleeping for almost three solid days at first, only getting up to finish off the rest of our provisions and for water and to pee in the bushes. And then when we'd slept enough but needed a fire and something to eat, I suddenly remembered the bag Isaac brought to the barn that we hid from Piper five months, or was it five years ago? Even at the very worst of times, it had never occurred to me to pray, but I did now. I prayed that the mice hadn't invaded the feed bin. I prayed the food hadn't all rotted in the summer heat. I prayed that all to all the gods I never believed in in my whole entire life that there would be enough for Piper and maybe some left over for me. I guess this means I now have to believe in God. The cheese was hard and moldy on the outside, but otherwise fine, and there was lots of it. The fruitcake stayed perfect in the tin, and the apple juice was fizzy, but not totally undrinkable. And the dried apricots were fine, as was a huge thick slab of chocolate wrapped in a brown paper. The only thing I had to throw was the way away was the rotten ham, which smelled enough like the awful smell of the farm to make me start retching again. Clear October nights were turned into clear October days, and though it was cold in the barn, it warmed up outside by mid-morning, and Piper said it was because the earth still held the heat from summer. So we laid our old blankets against the south wall of the barn and sat in the warmth of the stone wall like old ladies, drinking fermented apple juice watered down with rainwater to make it last, breaking off small pieces of cheese and fruitcake and trying to eat slowly so we didn't throw up from the shock of real food. It tasted almost too rich to eat and made our stomachs feel dizzy. We just sat there not moving, trying to repair our brains and our bodies with slow swallows of food and water and with peace and idleness and familiar surroundings. After a few days like this, we went to bed, deciding that the next morning we'd walk back to the house and see what we could find there. So I guess that meant we were turning back into something human again. In the middle of the night, I woke up and heard something rustling down below us in the barn. And my first thought was Edmund. And my second was, oh God, here we go again. And my third thought was that maybe it was a rat and we should check that the food was safe. But there was something about the way it sounded that was familiar. And as I went to sit up, I saw Piper's eyes suddenly wide open and awake and the first smile I'd seen on her face in so long. And she whistled in a soft way and the thing gave a little yip. And I almost laughed out loud, being the last one to realize it was Jet. We raced down to him and he was much thinner with a ragged looking coat, but otherwise he seemed fine and happy to see us. And he just lay there on his back in the most undignified way, wriggling with pleasure as we rubbed him and hugged him and kissed him and told him how much we missed him. Then I left Piper with him and went over and got a chunk of cheese and one of the fruitcake uh, out of the feed bin and fed it to him slowly, as slowly as I could, though it didn't seem to matter since he wolfed it down without chewing, and it was only not knowing how long we were going to be living on this food that stopped me from giving him all of it. He seemed so hungry. We were too excited to sleep, and neither of us wanted to let Jet out of our sight, so we half carried, half dragged him up to the loft, which he wasn't exactly wild about. But in the end, we all three lay down, 
and Jet a little separate from Piper. And with Piper's hand around his front paw for security, and me with my hand around Piper's front paw, also for security. And that's how we slept. The trip down to the house took a lot of strength, physical and mental, and we didn't have much left. Without saying anything, I braced myself for the worst, and what we found wasn't the worst, but the house was pretty well trashed, and it was a little like being kicked again when you're already down. The lights and telephone were still out. There were no messages, no notes, nothing that told us where to find Edmund and Isaac, but on the good side, there was also no smashed windows or shit spread around the walls just for the sake of it. A lot of the furniture had been thrown out in the in the barn, and most of it was shoved into the corners of rooms or turned upside down, and there were broken dishes everywhere. And the ones that weren't broken were caked and filthy, and the toilets were overflowing, and there was mud and dirt all over the rugs. And I guess the only reason our clothes hadn't been touched was that they were too small for anyone who to have bothered with. The kitchen was the worst, and I guess even army guys like to spend lots of time in the kitchen, and the big table was covered with heaps of paper. There were maps drawn on the wall, no food except what I'd found in the pantry that first day. And when Piper and I wanted to check the barn next door, there was no sign of the chickens or sheep or any other animals, which didn't tell us whether they'd been set loose or taken away or served up to the army for lunch. In the main bedrooms, things were a little better with furniture just pushed to one side and fairly clean. I had to hold my breath before opening the door to my little room, but stepping inside, I was surrounded by those walls, pure white and centuries old, and everything pretty much the same as the day I left, except the daffodils dead and papery in the bottle. I picked up a blanket from the floor and smoothed it onto the bed and looked out the window at the world outside and remembered arriving in a jeep with Edmund. I could still hear our voices in the walls. Before I went out, I opened the little chest of drawers to find clean clothes all neatly folded and right. Then I forgot about everything except wanting to be clean. I looked in the big mirror in the hall, which was a mistake, because for a minute I didn't recognize the person I saw there, including how thin I looked and how dirty and how matted my hair was, and the next thing I did was check the water in the taps, which turned out didn't work without the pump. Piper helped me lug buckets of water up the stairs from the rain barrel in the garden, and I filled a bath a little way with a bar of Aunt Pen soap, a bottle of shampoo, and a room full of clean clothes, I started to reinvent myself as a person. If you've ever worn the same clothes day and night for weeks, you'll know how amazing it feels when you make your skin silky and smooth again, and how happy you can be just cutting your fingernails and scrubbing the dirt out of your hands and feet with good soap that smells like roses, and then putting on clean clothes and brushing clean hair and letting it dry all soft and whispery, sounding in the sun. We filled it again for Piper's turn in the bath, and then she made me go up to her bedroom to choose some clothes for her, because she didn't want to go to herself. I don't know what she was scared of, but she was adamant that she wouldn't go, and the way little children are adamant that there might be something hiding in the closet in the dark. I guess she was scared of the ghosts that were creeping all around the house, and I couldn't blame her. I picked up some clothes for her, including a clean white shirt, which I knew was completely impractical, but the luxury of being clean and impractical was too much to resist. I also packed a bag of sensible things like jeans and sweaters with hoods and underwear and socks to wear at night on our hands and feet in case of bugs. When we were both clean and dressed in new clothes and had moved the furniture back where it belonged as best we could in the sitting room, we felt pretty cheered up. I think the best feeling was throwing away the filthy sneakers I've been wearing every day for over a month now and putting on a pair of loafers from my previous life that felt new and expensive and smelled like leather. We had to do something about Jet because he kept biting at the burrs st stuck in his coat, but he was definitely against the idea of a bath, and the best we could do was find his dog brush in the mudroom and take it up to the barn and try and clean up the tangled mess of his coat, which didn't please him much either. We also took a bag of dry dog food that was still in the pantry because feeding ourselves was enough of a problem without having to figure out how to feed Jet. It was heavy and a pain to carry, but neither of us knew whether he could manage for himself catching squirrels and rabbits. Back up at the barn, I carefully stowed our booty. Matches, soap, clean clothes, more blankets, dog food, a single candle I found under a chair, and some books. Collecting anything more than that would have required a second trip. And when you're tired and underfed, two miles cross-country feels more like more than enough. That evening, Piper disappeared while I was still sitting outside in the last warmth of the day. And after a while, I went to find her, and she'd gone on her own into a corner of the barn, wrapped in a blanket, hugging Jet, and was crying almost silently. Her nose and eyes red and swollen and her mouth open as the tears flowed out of her like a bottomless well. I didn't have to ask why she was crying. The fact that we were clean and more or less safe just made the absences more glaring. And for all my longing after Edmund, at least I'd come to terms with losing my mother a long time ago. But all Piper had left 
out of a mother and three brothers was me and a dog and a whole lot of unanswered questions. I wanted to tell someone that this was it, the last straw. I couldn't go on anymore with my own misery plus Piper's, which was so much worse. I felt full of rage and despair, like Job shaking his fist at God. And all I could do was sit with her and stroke her hair and murmur, enough, enough, because that's what we both had. Chapter 28. We couldn't go on. We went on. Staying alive was what we did to pass the time. Ages ago, I learned in social studies about how cavemen and bushmen and other primitive tribes spent every waking hour searching for food, and it was nice to be able to draw a good straight line through history between hairy old Neanderthal man and us. I was thinking of approaching my old school next time I was in New York and telling them to replace the unit on media communications with one on how to survive half-dead in the wild without much in the way of hope. Luckily, there was a fair amount of stuff around to eat just now, it being autumn, the season of fruitfulness and Thanksgiving, etc., but I won't pretend it was an interesting diet, and I could have killed for a grilled cheese and tomato sandwich on rye and a Diet Coke, which, come to think of it, was pretty radical for me, and only some of my thousand shrinks were he- and if only some of my thousand shrinks were here to pat themselves on the back and take the credit. Anyway, there were lots of potatoes because in order to get to the barn, you had to walk across an entire field planted with potatoes, and though the army guys living in our house had obviously noticed us this too, There are still only so many potatoes a small platoon of hungry sequesters can eat in a month, especially without any essential ingredients from mashed, fried, French fried, or potato salad. In other words, we still had about nine-tenths of the field left to eat. I spent most mornings digging potatoes and carrying them back to the barn to store in the feed bins, while Piper went off searching for natural morsels like watercress and sweet chestnuts and honey. As usual, she cornered the wood nymph market while I settled for old faithful. Some days, when I couldn't bear to dig up another spud, I went with her, and seeing Piper in full flight, you realize that whoever the father of these kids was, he had to be some kind of bona fide pixie. She knew how to follow honeybees back to their hives, and then how to get honeycomb out of them by making a torch out of a green branch so it smoked, and the bees either flew away or got dopey, enough to let her break off a chunk of the comb without stinging her. But to be safe, I watched this operation from as far away as possible. One day, she showed me about getting watercress out of a river and explained that you had to get it out of a running river, otherwise it would destroy your liver. What about a meandering river? I thought, I wondered to myself. This was one of the things I most dislike about nature, namely that the rules are not at all precise. Like when Piper says, I'm pretty sure that mushroom isn't poisonous. Anyway, I didn't really know what to do with a big fat sticky dripping honeycomb and a couple of fistfuls of watercress other than sending them into some factory where they'd be wrapped up in styrofoam and plastic. But amazingly, they tasted just like honey and watercress without having anything to do without having to do anything at all to them. And what with digging up potatoes as well, I was starting to think that except for the deli counters and five or ten thousand other totally essential total essential supermarkets were pretty much a waste of time. In the meantime, I learned the hard way to store things like honey in a tightly covered container if you didn't want to get every bug on earth flying in for a taste. Piper could smell wild garlic and onion in a meadow, and when she came home with armfuls of the stuff, which we shredded up to make potatoes with wild onions and garlic for a change from potatoes without wild onions and garlic. There were days I would happily have traded the entire future of England for a single jar of mayonnaise, but unfortunately, the opportunity never arose. We roasted sweet chestnuts on the fire, and they were pretty good, except incredibly hard to peel, and their skin got under your fingernails and hurt for days. I spent practically a whole afternoon collecting chestnuts. When I got back, Piper looked at me um, with those as close as she ever got to contempt and said, those are horse chestnuts and inedible. There are a few rows of sweet corn in Aunt Penn's vegetable garden, along with whatever cabbages hadn't been eaten by the British Army and the Slug Army and also a fair number of squashes, some leeks, beans, and mint running wild. I brought a heavy frying pan up from the house, and because we had no cooking oil, we steamed vegetables in water over the fire. Piper said we should catch a rabbit and kill it for the fat to cook with, but when I looked to see if she was out of her mind, she got kind of defensive and said, that's what the Boy Scout handbook says. A few days later, Piper said we should try try a fishing expedition, and the thought of it made my heart sink because of our perfect day, and not wanting ever to go there again and ruin it. But nostalgia wasn't a big part of the decision-making process these days, so we got Piper's fishing rod and set off. 
It was cloudy and drizzling, which Piper said was good for fishing, and as usual, I watched while she lured food onto the bank. But once she caught anything, I had to follow her directions about killing and cleaning it while she turned her head away. I had no complaints about Piper, but I could have lived without ripping the guts out of a dead trout to save her from doing it. Not to mention whacking them over the head with a club in the first place. I hated doing it, but I could do it, and I guess that was the difference between us. Later, there was poached pink trout that made most of the things you eat in life taste gross by comparison, followed by hazelnuts mashed up with honey, and afterwards we had mint tea, and it was nice but you couldn't help lying awake at night thinking about toast and butter. In the days that followed, we figured out how to make soup from whatever we could add to a pot, and that was much better than just boiling things one by one. Leek and potato was the best, and when we ran out of leeks, we used wild onions. We set as much as we could store aside. There were only two feed bins in the barn built to keep out mice, and I'd already stacked one with potatoes, and the other halfway with nuts and corn and cabbages. What we really needed was a huge amount of refrigerator freezer with ice maker and root beer dispenser. One funny thing was that I didn't look much different now from the day I arrived in England, but the difference was that I ate now ate what I could. Somewhere along the line, I'd lost the will not to eat. Partly, I wouldn't be good old Daisy if I didn't get my appetite back just when everyone else in the world was learning how to starve, and partly the idea of wanting to be thin in a world full of people dying from lack of food struck me, even me, as stupid. Well, what do you know? Every war has its silver lining. Chapter 29. I knew Edmund would come back to us if he could. I tried doing the thing they do with dogs in the movies, saying, Jet, fetch Edmund and pointing in a general direction of the wide world, and he didn't bound off like Lassie following a hot scent, just sat there and stared at me politely for a few seconds, then lost interest when it turned out I wasn't going to clarify my request. Can't you at least set Jet to look for gin, I asked Piper in a what kind of dog whisper are you tone of voice? But she shook her head and said he'd find her if he knew where to look. We both looked over at him, sitting with his nose slightly raised in the breeze. See, Piper said, he's keeping tabs in the neighborhood. All the smells from miles around are filtering past his nose. I came across Piper deep in conversation with Jet one afternoon, and when I asked her what they were talking about, she shrugged and said dog things. Sometimes the loneliness of being the odd man out in these conversations got to be, but most of the time I just ignored it. I like old movies. She talks to dogs. As the days passed and there were no sign of Edmund and Isaac, I had to fight the unbearable fear that always lurked at the back of my mind. It took a long time to admit that I could no longer feel his presence. And sometimes I lay awake until dawn, listening desperately to the silence and trying to remember his face. Sometimes I thought I heard Edmund's voice in my head, but it always turned out to be my subconscious, replaying old tapes out of some perverse kind of nostalgia. I denied what appeared to be fact. And yet I had seen the dead people. I'd look carefully at every hideous nightmare face just to be sure. I found myself drawn more and more to the big house just to make sure Edmund wasn't waiting for us there, or had managed to drag himself that far but no further. I made excuses to Piper about being gone for a few hours and just told her I'd found something in the vegetable garden that would ripe, be ripe any day now, like tomatoes, or maybe we needed something more, like clean socks. She didn't mind me going alone because she didn't much like going there herself on account of the ghosts, and also she probably more or less knew why I was going and was glad to have someone check on the off chance. She always took Jet with her for company, so I had no early warning system, and every time I approached the house, I searched for portents, strange cloud patterns, 13 magpies, frogs the size of antelopes, that sort of thing. Someday I was convinced, some days I was convinced I could sense something, or I experienced an uncanny, mystical feeling, but it won't make the six o'clock news if I tell you I was always wrong. It didn't matter. Each time my heart would race at the smallest suggestion that we had company. Usually it was a moth thudding against a window or mice or nothing at all. Once there, I tried to put things back the way they belonged. I moved furniture, swept rugs, washed plates with cold water and bars of soap, scrubbed dirt off walls. Sometimes I just sat in the room that Emin shared with Isaac, hoping something would be different. Sometimes I put on his clothes and drifted around the house looking for something I didn't know what. I frightened myself. I became the ghost Piper was so scared of. One day we went down to the house together because Piper wanted a bath. 
There was no use pretending I had a premonition when Piper was around, because if any manifestation was going to make itself manifest, it wasn't going to be to me. We had to haul buckets in as usual, and the bath was cold, but at least it took place in the bathtub. And then we sat around for a while in the garden and swapped books we'd read for unread ones, and I guess it was a little like going to a movie in the olden days before the war. Something different to do. For a while, there was total peace and quiet, with nothing but the sound of Piper humming quietly and the shift shaft shift shafting of the apple tree and me turning the pages of the book. Then the telephone rang. It was such an unfamiliar sound, we forgot how to react. For an eternity, neither of us moved. Piper sat terrified, eyes wide. I'd never left a ringing phone in my life, and I wasn't going to start now. I brought the receiver up to my ear, but said nothing. Hello? said the voice, and for a moment I couldn't place it. Hello? it said again, and then in a pleading tone, whoever you are, please say something. And then I recognized the voice. Hello, I said. It's Daisy. Daisy.